الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين المظلومين سيما بقية الله في الأرض وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وولي نعمتنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه في أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have been exploring the incredibly deep and insightful and profoundly beautiful letter of the commander of the faithful to his son, Imam al Hassan al Mushtaba. And we discussed some of the passages last night. I want to continue with the sermon or with the letter that is tonight as well, insha'Allah, before addressing the critically important occasion uh, that we commemorate on this special night. The Imam spoke about the importance of examining the experiences of people who have lived prior to us. And on that point, I wish to make an important observation, which is that it's one thing to look at ancient history and try and extrapolate lessons from communities and civilizations and groups that lived before us to try and understand how we can overcome the challenges in our own lives. Because as they say, history often repeats itself. And given that human nature is constant, uh, hardly ever changes, the circumstances might change, the tools with which we build our 
towns and cities and farms and civilizations might develop. But ultimately, human nature is the same. We share the same set of fears, desires, temptations, spiritual and emotional flaws and shortcomings. They're almost exactly the same. And if you read history, you will always find uh, parallels between those who lived in the past and your own selves and those around you. So for example, if you read about the lives of previous kings and emperors and leaders, you will find that although the ch names have changed, the faces have changed, but the desires and temptations and many of the actions that emanate from those human tendencies are more or less the same. And this is something that the Imam instructs us to explore and to try and understand. But there's also a great deal of benefit in studying communities in our own lifetime. So you don't have to go back all the way to ancient history to understand that as a community that is growing in number and that is thriving and prospering in this part of the world where we are ultimately just a minority, many of the challenges that we face in this day and age, and I know many community leaders as well as regular members, as well as parents and educators and scholars, we are talking about and discussing the challenges of our day. But it helps to know that we're not the first to face those challenges. And if you cannot find parallels to our problems in ancient history, you almost certainly can find parallels in the lives of other communities that are contemporaneous to us, meaning that they have lived in the last two decades, three decades or so. For instance, as a community, we're now trying to explore ways with which to not only impart knowledge about our faith to the next generation, but also immunize them from the dangers that lurk behind every corner. We're trying to uh, protect them from being swept away by the different demonic ideologies that surround us. Once again, the community in this country is not the first to go through those challenges. It's important, in fact, it's absolutely pivotal that we try and learn from the experiences of communities in other countries. Because what you're experiencing today, many communities in the United States experienced about 10 or 20 years ago. They had to grapple with those challenges and now they have come up with solutions. And of course you can argue whether those solutions are sufficient and satisfactory or not, but that's the benefit of hindsight. That's the benefit of looking at how they struggled and wrestled with those challenges. Try and take lessons from their solutions and address any shortcomings in the way they uh, address those problems. This is perhaps one of the reasons why it is so highly recommended to travel in Islam. Traveling in and of itself in our beautiful faith is a recommended act. You get rewarded for traveling. Imagine that. You go on a vacation, you get thawab for that. Imagine if you travel, not just to enjoy yourself, not just to perhaps let off some steam from work and other commitments, but to meet other members of the fraternity of the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt in other countries and other nations. Meet with community leaders there, meet with scholars there, exchange ideas with them. In particular, North America, in particular, those who happen to live in Europe. 
This is the job of community leaders, but that doesn't absolve individual members from this responsibility. You can perhaps travel and exhaust your efforts in exchanging ideas with other community members, come back and provide some positive and constructive feedback to those who lead the community. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed with the problems that we're facing. We feel all alone. We feel isolated. But you're not alone. Our religion is based on actions. If you look at the branches of religion, what we call furu' al-deen, the majority of them are communal activities. They're not things that an individual performs on their own. Even salat, which is an individual form of worship, is recommended to be performed in a congregation. And the thawab of congregation is so exceedingly high that the only time when you're allowed to perform wajib salah, the obligatory prayer, while walking as if you're about to join a congregational prayer. You walk into the masjid, the congregation is, is ongoing, you can pr start the pr prayer, you can uh, initiate it, and then walk towards the congregation. In fact, there are so many flexibilities that scholars have offered when it comes to joining a congregational prayer, which all goes to highlight what? The importance of building a community. So you're not on your own. And you're certainly not the first person to face those challenges when it comes to parenting, when it comes to individual accountability, when it comes to protecting your family from harmful ideas and thoughts and beliefs. All you have to do is reach out and speak to other people. So that's just one point I wanted to highlight about the importance of learning from other people's experiences. Then the Imam says to his son, فَأَصْلِحْ مَثْوَاكِ وَلَا تَبِعْ آخِرَتَكَ بِدُنْيَاكِ The Imam says, prepare your final abode. Meaning, think of the fact that you will be buried in a hole six feet under the ground. Try and prepare that for yourself. Try and make it more comfortable for yourself. And we all know the only way to do that isn't to build a big shrine, which is why in Islam, it's discouraged to build the grave above four fingers in height. There is no shrine for people. And as I said, it's discouraged to do that. You can't really take your money, you can't take your checkbook, you can certainly take it with you, but it's absolutely useless. What you can take with you are your good deeds and actions. Never sell too cheap. Imagine if you wanted to sell your house, you didn't do much due diligence, you didn't explore the market, and your friend comes along and says, I want to buy it from you. And they offer a price. And because it's a distress sale, for example, you sell it at the price suggested to you. Then someone calls you and says, you know, your neighbor was desperate to buy a house in the same neighborhood and he would have paid twice the amount that you sold it for. How do you feel about that? Don't you feel cheated? Don't you feel that you sold too cheap? The Imam says, don't sell too cheap. Don't sell th the afterlife in exchange for this lowly, lowly and petty life. Don't do that. Make sure that if you're spending your time and effort in something, that you're getting the highest possible price for it. That your time here is spent wisely. Amir al-Mu'mineen, they say that when he was having a haircut. Imagine the barber is trying to trim the imam's mustache. The imam would continue to recite dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for a barber to trim your mustache while your lips are moving is next to impossible. It's going to end up ragged. So the barber would tell the imam, could you stop for just one second while I trim your mustache? Which I don't know how long that would take. 
let's say 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever, the Imam would tell him it's not worth it. Even a few seconds of stopping the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to get a finer line is not worth it. Sometimes, especially the youth, you see them obsessed with their haircuts. But why exactly? I mean, you cut the hair and then a week or 10 days or two weeks later, it grows back out. So what? And what's worse than that is when they try to emulate these celebrities, these athletes, these sports stars and whatnot. In fact, they take a picture. They're like, I want to look like this, Mr. So-and-so. Why exactly? Because he knows how to kick a ball into a net. That's his skill. That's his worth. That's why he's such a, a source of emulation. And so this obsession is simply not worth it. As the Imam says, وَلَا تَبِعْ آخِرَتَكَ بِدُنْيَا One thing I have to mention here, which I think goes without saying, is that we're not saying that you should live your life as some kind of a monk to live in a cage and not engage and not make a living and not buy a house and these sorts of things. Nobody's saying that. In fact, one hadith states, لَيْسَ minna, He is not one of us. مَنْ بَاعَ دُنْيَاهُ بِآخِرَتِهِ Whoever sells the afterlife in exchange for this world, obviously, this person is not one of us. The afterlife is much more important. Then the Imam says, and he is not one of us who abandons this world in exchange for the afterlife. You can't live your life like some kind of uh, monk who's completely detached from your reality. This world is supposed to be lived and led in such a manner where you are fulfilled and content and your family's happy and safe and secure. But at the same time, you do so in a deliberate manner. Nowadays, uh, these... Um, Productivity gurus and whatnot, they always talk about this. The concept of deliberate, being deliberate, being intentional about what you do. In other words, when you buy a car, what is the purpose for buying this car? It has to somehow connect to the akhirah. When you get married, what is the purpose of your marriage? It has to connect to the akhirah. When you have children, when you buy a house, when you go out on a vacation, when you do all these things, which are part parts of living a normal and content life in this world. But it has to be intentional, it has to be deliberate. In other words, it can't be without a purpose. It has to serve your time in your grave. Then the Imam says, Brothers and sisters, if this entire letter of Amir al muminin if you forgot everything that's in it, Except this passage, it would be more than enough. It'd be more than enough for our salvation and avoiding the pitfalls of the dunya. The Imam says, Da'il qawl, abandon, leave, speaking about things that you do not understand. The things that you don't know. Don't talk about them. Da'il qawl fi ma la ta'rif, wal khitaba fi ma. I could list an endless array of things that fall under this passage of the Imam's letter. Not talking about matters that don't fall within your expertise. If you were asked for advice about a medical problem that your wife is going through, your child is going through, and you know that you're not an expert in this matter, the best course of action is to refer that individual to the doctor. The best thing you can do for them is to drive them to the emergency unit in the hospital, for example. But to give your advice that's not grounded in knowledge and expertise is a dangerous thing to do. That's why in many countries, you're not allowed to do this. You're legally prohibited from providing medical advice if you are not an expert on television in certain countries. You could say, but it's my TV channel and people aren't bound to take my advice. You're not allowed to. Because your advice 
could very much be erroneous and wrong. And that erroneous advice could lead to physical harm. Now, when it comes to matters of religion, isn't that even more dangerous? And yet people, subhanAllah, it doesn't stop them from having opinions and then expressing those opinions. Listen to what the Quran says. And taqulu, the shaytan, he pushes you towards acts of evil and sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says one of the things the shaytan does is that he compels you and pushes you and taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. To, th- to say things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that which you don't know. You have no clue. You might have heard something from here, read something from there, but you're not an expert. You don't know that for a fact. Shaitan wants you to do this because this is one of the easiest means of deviation that he could use against others. Oh, I heard such and such say that this is what we believe about this subject. And taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun. As a matter of fact, look at how far Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes. He says, "Man adlamu mimman iftara ala Allahi kadiba." Who is more oppressive than the one who speaks a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A lie is what? A lie is a statement that contradicts reality. In other words, me expressing an opinion about a matter of religion is to ascribe a lie to Allah. What's mind-boggling about this verse in the Quran is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is the worst thing you can do. One of the worst sins. Who's more oppressive than that? Allah says. Which is why the hadith says مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ Now, there are two branches in this statement of the Imam. The first is he says, don't speak about matters that you don't know. Especially when it comes to matters of religion. The other part, the Imam says, don't talk about things that have nothing to do with you. And we do that all the time. We hear gossip about someone. Oh, did you hear that some, so-and-so got divorced? Suddenly we have a long list of opinions to express about that. But what's that got to do with you? How is that your concern? The Imam says, don't speak about matters that you don't understand. And don't talk about things that are not concerned with you, not connected to you. Just be quiet. So many problems would be averted if we followed this advice of Amir al muminin Moving on, the Imam says, وَأَمْسِكْ عَنْ طَرِيقٍ إِذَا خِفْتَ ضَلَالَتَهِ He says, if you ever come across a path and you fear that this path could be misleading, simply don't go. I mean, that's common sense advice, isn't it? If you think that the approach that you're going to utilize is wrong and going to lead you in a place that you didn't intend to go, the Imam says, don't go there. فَإِنَّ الْكَفَّ عِنْدَ حَيْرَةِ If you stop and refrain from going down a path that you fear could lead to deviation, خَيْرٌ مِّنْ رُكُوبِ الْأَحْوَالِ that is much better than falling into a trap, falling into a place that you that could potentially harm you. Now, what this means is civilization today encourages risk taking, doesn't it? You're always hearing about this new investment opportunity. Now, it could be the worst thing ever. But society has this ingrained idea that risks equal rewards. That if you take a higher risk, because the risk is high, if you end up profiting from this venture, if, you, if it works out for you, you will also be rewarded abundantly. 
right? At the same time, if you're seeking financial advice, they will tell you that given that the risk is high, it means that if you lose, you'll lose a great deal as well. But the Imam isn't talking about financial benefit or loss. The Imam is talking about the grand scheme of things. He's talking about the more existential questions about following the path of righteousness as opposed to the path that leads you astray. And we all know that the path of righteousness, Sirat al-Mustaqim, is only one, whereas the path towards deviation are infinite. They're infinite. In one hadith, Rasulullah sat down on the sand. He took a piece of wood or with his index finger, he drew a line. He said, that is the straight path. Then he drew deviant lines from that straight line. I don't know how many, 5, 10, 20, 50, God knows. The Imam said, these are deviant paths and at every one of those paths, there is a demon. In other words, there is the potential, the, the potential, I should rephrase, for deviation is much greater than finding the right path and sticking to it. Some people might say, but what if I lose? What if I stand to make a loss? Well, the common sense approach would tell you that if you lose out on making a profit, that is better than losing your capital. In other words, mysticism and Sufism, it offers so much, it's beautiful. It, give, it, it even gives you this high, right? It, it makes you feel so good about yourself. By the way, so do drugs. But nobody says drugs are good for you, right? But let's say there is something of substance, something of benefit in mysticism. The potential of being led astray is also great. Now let's say you live your entire life without any potential possible benefits in mysticism, so what? So what? At the very least, you know that you didn't go down a path that had the potential of leading you astray. Isn't that true? Let's say you didn't benefit from all the beautiful things that Sufism has to offer. So what? As long as I know that I'm following the Holy Prophet and his family, in addition to the Holy Quran, إِنِّي تَارِكُمْ فِيكُمْ أُلْفَقَلَيْنِ كِتَابَ اللَّهُ وَعَطْرَةِ أَهْلَ بَيْتِ I know that I'm following the right path. Maybe Hindus and Buddhists and this religion and that sect, maybe they have something of benefit. I don't care. I'd rather protect my faith, my belief, my conviction, and not risk being led astray than any potential benefit that they could offer me. Isn't that true? Isn't that what the intellect tells you? Just follow the Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Quran and you're safe. Rasulullah is telling you, you're safe if you do that. Did Salman study mysticism? Did Abu Dhar study mysticism? Was any of these righteous companions of Rasulullah or the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, was Zurara a mystic? Of course not. Even though they will tell you things like that. Oh, subhanAllah, Uwaisul Qarani, some of these Sufi sects, they claim to trace their tariqah back to Uwais al-Qarani. Okay, where did Uwais al-Qarani say, Al-Wahid wa la yasduru minhu illa al-Wahid? Which is one of the foundational principles of philosophy and Sufism. Uwais al-Qarani, even if Uwais al-Qarani had something that was then taken by this so-called tariqah and was manifested in their Sufi dervish dances. Let's say that's something that he did. So what? I follow Muhammad and Al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salla wa sallam. I remember telling someone, he said, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, he's got some beautiful things. And he was a Shia by the way, which of course he was not. There is no conceivable way that a person like Ibn Arabi was a Shia. Absolutely not. If anybody reads his works, you will come to the conclusive and definitive conclusion that he was not a Shia of the Ahlul Bayt. Right? Oh, but he praised Amir al-Mu'mineen somewhere. So what? So does Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. 
the maniacal terror group. The fact that someone praises the Ahlul Bayt is not the barometer of their religious affiliation. And so I had a lengthy discussion with him, citing evidence of his deviation, in fact of his kufr, in fact of the fact that he saw himself as a prophet and ultimately God himself. But setting all of that aside, I said to him, let's say Ibn Arabi has something of benefit. And let's assume, for argument's sake, let's assume the impossible, which is that he was a Shia. Don't you think that you should refer to the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, themselves as opposed to try and bend over backwards to prove that someone who's a deviant was not a deviant and was a Shia and so on and so forth will go straight to the source, Ya Habib. Go straight to Al Muhammad. Go to Amir al Mu'mineen. Go to Imam Zayn al Habadeen. Go to Imam al Rabbi salam. And the Imam openly declares, he says, these people are the worst of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reference to Sufis and mystics. Then he says, and you will never find someone who loves our enemies and who also loves us. Because their love to the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt was manifest and beyond question. They can't possibly combine and reconcile these two together. Moving on, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam refers to this concept, the importance of being cautious. Be cautious. Scrutinize your source of knowledge. Don't be a blind follower when it comes to matters of religion. Question those who speak to you and quote anyone other than Al-Baqir was Sadiq. Question them, debate them, challenge them. The Imam says, things are of three kinds. He simplifies it all the way down to its bare bones so that everyone understands. He says, Things are of three types. Something that is evidently true. Evidently, obviously, it is true. There's no doubt about that. That should be followed. And something that is evidently false, patently wrong. There's no question that this path leads to deviation. In this case, common sense tells you that you should avoid it. Then you have the gray area in between. The Imam says, Something that seems confusing. You don't know whether it falls into the first category or the second category. What do you do there? يُرَدُّ عِلْمُهُ إِلَى اللَّهُ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولِ Refer it back to, the, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to His Prophet and to the Imam of the time. And if you have no access to the Imam of the time, then you avoid it until it's clarified. In other words, there is no gray area. There is black and there is white. And in between the black and the white, you have nothing but black. You, avoid, you don't take risks when it comes to religion. It's a dangerous and sensitive area of our lives that we simply cannot take any risks in. Rasulullah also says something similar to that. He says, Halalun bayyin, when it comes to halal and haram, when you're not sure, the Holy Prophet says, Something, some things are halal, they're permissible, obviously. And there are things that are impermissible, once again, and it's obvious. And in between these two, you have shubhat. A shubha is something that resembles both of them. You don't know which one that thing is. If you're someone who avoids the shubha, you avoid the things that are in the gray space, that are confusing. If you have that proclivity to avoid the questionable things, then you will most certainly avoid the haram things. You create a buffer between you and the things that are patently impermissible. Woman As for the one who's careless, the one who simply isn't concerned, 
Oh, I'm not sure if this is halal or haram. I'll do it anyway. وَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِالشُّبُهَاتِ ارْتَكَبَ الْمُحَرَّمَاتِ That person will ultimately commit impermissible act. وَهَلَكَ مَنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْلَمُ And he or she will perish due to causes that they don't understand. In other words, you might have good intentions, but ultimately, if you eat any street food, especially in countries where it's not regulated, and I'm sure you've seen Instagram videos about some really questionable stuff being sold to people. If you eat from anything, then when you get sick, you have no one to blame but yourself now. I wish to talk a little bit about an individual to whom we are all indebted, brothers and sisters. Khadija bint Khuwaylid, salamullahi alayha. You know, in history, the vast overwhelming majority of people come into this world, live out their lives, enjoy themselves, they suffer along as well, and eventually die never to be remembered again. The majority of people. Then again, you have people who perform certain tasks and do things that immortalize them. They literally alter the course of human history. And this group of people, even though they're a tiny minority, they come in both good and bad flavors. You have the worst of the worst who were consequential in causing so much damage to the human chronicles. And I could list many names, and I'm sure you can think of many yourself. Then you have people whose sacrifices and whose actions were so incredibly beautiful that they ended up providing humanity with infinitely precious gifts that we all become indebted to them. One of them, perhaps one of the single most important was Khadija, salamullahi alayhi. You've all heard the prophetic hadith. And the hadith, by the way, has been mentioned in multiple contexts, which tells you that the Prophet didn't say this, didn't make the statement just once, but on many, many different occasions. Ma abdalani Allahu khayram minha. In fact, just merely reading the hadith, you know that there was context behind it. There was a backstory. The Prophet says, Allah never replaced me with anyone better than Khadija. The Prophet married many women, but none was like Khadija. Why? The Prophet says, آمَنَتْ حِينَ كَفَرَ النَّاسِ She believed me when everyone belied me. Everyone abandoned me. Everyone refused to acknowledge my status. And yet she believed me. وَصَدَّقَتْنِي حِينَ كَذَّبَ بِيَ النَّاسِ She not only had faith in me, but believed everything I told her when everyone accused me of being a liar. وَوَاسَتْنِي بِمَالِهَا حِينَ حَرَمِيَ النَّاسِ And she consoled me with her wealth when I was driven out by everyone. I was not supported by anyone other than Khadija. وَرُزِقْتُ الْوُلْدَ مِنْهَا وَلَمْ أُرْزَقْ مِنْ غَيْرِهَا And I was blessed with children from her but not from anybody else. All the other wives of the Prophet, either in some cases they had children who passed away, like Mari al Qibtiya and her son Ibrahim, or they were barren, they were infertile, they didn't have any children. Now why this matters is the bravest person isn't simply the soldier who happens to be in an army that is so well equipped it could crush the enemy. That doesn't make you a brave soldier, does it? A brave soldier is one who continues to advance in the enemy's direction while everyone is fleeing, everyone is deserting. Which is why Rasulullah is quoted to have said to Abi Dhar, Ya Aba Dhar, 
كالمقاتل في الفارين the one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a community of people who are distracted from God's remembrance is like the one who charges towards the enemy while everyone is deserting their positions. Khadija did what no one did to Rasulullah. She was the first believer along with Ali ibn Abi Talib. But of course, in order to diminish her status, They've relegated her position to the first among the women to believe in Rasulullah. And we all know why they do that. They do it because they want to give something. They're so desperate to offer some rank or status to their idols and make them among the first adults to believe in Rasulullah. The first of the elderly to believe in Rasulullah. Even though he wasn't even number 50 in the list of those who embraced Islam, but in order to do that, they have to diminish the status of Khadija, the first to believe in the Holy Prophet when everyone abandoned him. Sahih Muslim, other sources in the Sunni tradition have stated the following, that Aisha said, I was never envious towards the other wives of the Holy Prophet the way I was envious of Khadija even though I never met her. Imagine the jealousy, imagine the envy, imagine the hatred. She's not even around anymore. And yet, she acknowledges that she was jealous. And she says that when Neelam adrukha qalat wa kana rasulullah this I want you to focus on. The Holy Prophet, وكان, in, in Arabic when they say that such and such, that such a person, for example, كان يفعل كذا, it means that he did it repeatedly. It didn't happen just on one occasion, but it happened over and over again. وكان رسول الله إذا ذبح الشات, if they offered the Prophet a gift, if they gave him a sheep, for example, the Holy Prophet would cut the sheep into pieces almost every time. Take this to the friends of Khadija, which tells you why she was so envious. Not only did Rasulullah speak of the merits of Khadija and her virtues, but he remained so loyal to her that even after her death, he would honor her friends. Ila asdiqa'i Khadija, the friends of Khadija. Those who remained loyal companions to Khadija. And this is partly because that we all know Khadija was abandoned by the women of Quraysh. When she decided to marry the Holy Prophet, everyone began to mock her. Imagine being ostracized. Imagine being abandoned. Even though you're an A-lister, you're an elite in the community and the group of people who were considered millionaires and billionaires. Khadija was the top person. Everyone looked up to her. Suddenly, those in her inner circle, those that she considered friends, all abandoned her to the point that when she gave birth to Fatima to Zahra, no one came to help her. We've all heard this. And so, the few friends that Khadija did have, Rasulullah, was so loyal to Khadija that every gift he received, he would send to them. And I want to say just a, something about this, if I may. Brothers and sisters, Rasulullah looked after the people who were considered among the friends of Khadija. And that means that if you and I did things that would elevate our rank, to the friends of Khadija, Rasulullah would look after us as well, wouldn't he? How can we become friends of Khadija? In fact, I encourage the sisters to organize programs in honor of Lady Khadija and call that group Asdiqa'u Khadija. As well as the brothers. We should honor Khadija by ensuring that the misconceptions, the lies, the stories concocted against her are erased and corrected. I'm sure many of you have heard that when Rasulullah married Khadija, Khadija was 40 years old and Rasulullah was 25. That's a lie. That's a lie that's been picked up from sources 
that had allegiance towards women who hated Khadija, who were envious of Khadija. They say that Khadija, and I'll talk a little bit about this now, inshallah. They say that Khadija was 40 years old when she got married to Rasulullah, number one. Number two, she already had children from previous marriages, which tells you that she had been married multiple times. And they mentioned a few names prior to getting married to Rasulullah. Why do they say that? So as to elevate the rank of that individual who was envious of Khadija and say she was the only virgin that Rasulullah married and that she was so young. In fact, she was so young, she was six years old. All these lies, all these lies are designed to elevate the rank of this individual and in doing so, diminish the value of Khadija bint Khuwaylid and the sad reality is many of us followers of the Ahlul Bayt have fallen for these lies. There were a few things that Khadija was not. As I said, one of them was that she was 40 years old. There is compelling, conclusive, definitive evidence that Khadija was around 25 years of age when she married Rasulullah. There are reports that say she was as young as 23. And there are reports that say, within our tradition, that she was 28. But the majority of those references say that she was 25, and it's the average. If we wanted to average out those references, she was 25 years old. End of discussion. Who cares what Ibn Kathir says? Who cares what the Habi says? Who cares what Bukhari and Muslims say? Because we know that they had nefarious intentions. We know why they did that and why they made up those lies. So Khadija was not 40 years old, number one. Number two, Khadija had not been married before getting married to Rasulullah. Report after report, hadith after hadith says that Khadija was looking for Rasulullah her entire adult life. Khadija had heard reports from Christian monks, from people who were well-versed in ancient scriptures about the advent of the final messenger. She had kept herself to get married to that man because they, there were indications that his advent was imminent. It was going to happen very soon and it was going to happen in Mecca. That's why the Jews and the Christians had gone to Mecca. They knew all of this, Khadija Jinn didn't. There is even one report where she heard from someone about the attributes of the final messenger of Allah. And Khadija prayed to Allah that I wish to be his wife. By the way, Khadija's religion was the Hanifiyya. Khadija was a member of Quraysh. In fact, she was related to Rasulullah. Khadija's great-great-grandfather was the same of Rasulullah. So they were related. And just like many members of many Hashim, like Abu Talib, Abdul Muttalib, and others, they followed the religion of Ibrahim السلام, which is called al Hanifiyya. Khadija was a believer. Khadija never prostrated before an idol. Khadija was expecting Rasulullah and waiting for him. Which is why she waited until she was about 25 years old, never getting married to anyone else. Now I know this opens the door to the question about the two daughters of Khadija and Zainab and Umm Kulthum or Ruqayya uh, and Zainab and whether they were the daughters of Rasulullah or Khadija or Khadija's uh, sister Hala and all of this discussion I believe once again almost definitively almost a hundred percent that they were all children of Khadija and Rasulullah they were the sisters of Fatima to Zahra that does not diminish the status of Fatima to Zahra in any way, shape, or form. But they were, without a doubt, the daughters of Rasulullah and the daughters of Khadija. There was no previous marriage, as I said. So that's one thing that Khadija was not. The other thing that Khadija was not was a quote unquote businesswoman. I'm sure you've heard this again from different sources. Oh, Khadija was a businesswoman. No, she was not. At least she most definitely was not a so-called businesswoman 
as or during the time she was married to Rasulullah. Why? Khadija was the wealthiest woman and perhaps the wealthiest individual in the Arabian Peninsula. She was the equivalent of the central bank now. She would lend money to other businesses. Other wealthy merchants would come and borrow money from her. There's no question about that. How she was able to accumulate all of that wealth is irrelevant. Whether it was an inheritance from her father who was killed in a battle, whether it was her business activities, buying and selling, being a merchant, having caravans that work for you, again, that's irrelevant. What is important is this. When people tell you that Khadija was a businesswoman, that's usually in the context of women being in the workforce. People who talk about Khadija's business activities are trying to uh, portray her as someone who was almost like, um, you know, working from nine to five. She has an office, she goes out there and she makes money while Rasulullah does his thing. Far from it. Far from it. Khadija did what she did prior to getting married to Rasulullah. And the way it worked was that she would have employees, she would have individuals reporting to her and making the money that she did. But when she married Rasulullah, here's what happened. Khadija sent a message to the Holy Prophet to come and ask for her hand in marriage. Because once again, she noticed the Prophet's reliability, trustworthiness. She saw the signs that have been recorded in ancient scriptures about the final messenger. And she connected the dots. So she sent him a message through her servant that ultimately in that society, the way marriages would be initiated was that the man would have to come with his family and ask for the girl's hand in marriage. So Rasulullah spoke to his uncle Abu Talib and they all went to Warakat ibn Nawfal, who was the uncle of Khadija. They went. The story is mentioned in great detail in Al-Kafi and other sources. Abu Talib spoke and addressed the family of Khadija by saying that you will never find anyone like my nephew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You can look far and wide. Anyone else, if compared to my nephew, you will see how he is superior and better in every conceivable way. And he wishes to marry your daughter Khadija. He desires her. And so does she. So even in the proposal, he was open about the fact that Khadija wanted the Prophet and the Prophet wanted her. Then after Abu Talib spoke once again at length about the virtues of the Holy Prophet, the other side, Waraqat ibn Nawfal, also spoke and said, we acknowledge everything that you have said. Rasulullah was well known. Yes, he was poor. Yes, he was an orphan. But everyone knew just what kind of an incredibly exceptional individual he was. And so he said, we acknowledge all of this. Muhammad. I marry them, I give my blessings. Then Abu Talib said that the dowry shall be 500 silver coins. Very specific, 500. Rasulullah stipulated this. Listen to this brothers and sisters. There's a lesson in this. Rasulullah says, I have never married anyone else. And I have never gotten married myself except based on the dowry of Khadija. The dowry of Khadija has become the standard. Now, of course, you can demand more money. You can demand hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want it. You can make all kinds of conditions if you want. But if you want to follow the tradition of Rasulullah and Khadija, if you wish to be blessed the way Khadija was blessed and the way Rasulullah and his lineage was blessed, then you try and emulate the example 
that they set as much as, much as you possibly can. 500 silver coins, which in today's money is about $1,200. That's it. Khadija said, I will pay the dowry no matter how much it was. In fact, according to one report, she brought in camel loads of gold and she put it all in the room and it, it was so much that it was too high and the two sides couldn't even see each other. She said, I will pay the dowry myself. Here is the dowry. I give it to you, to the Holy Prophet. Take it and give it to me if you wish. Rasulullah said, your dowry will be 500 silver coins. Khadija said, I will pay that as well. So then they finished. They all came to an agreement. Rasulullah got up and was about to leave. One source says the following. Khadija called the Holy Prophet. She said to him, Ya Muhammad, Al-Baytu Baytuk. Where are you going? Stay. This is your house. Wal-Amatu Amatuk. And I am your maid. Then she sent a message to Rasulullah saying, I give you all of my wealth. Those who have feministic objectives, who call Khadija a businesswoman, should also mention the fact that Khadija forfeited her entire portfolio, all of her possessions, all of her gold, everything that she owned to Rasulullah on the first night of her wedding. Everything was given to the Holy Prophet. She was never a businesswoman after that. Which is why I, I, I ask my dear sisters to support your husbands. Support them, help them. Look at this hadith. The hadith says, Ja'a rajulun ila Rasulillah. This is in our primary sources, in the, uh, the four original books. A man came to Rasulullah and he described his wife to the Prophet. He said, Inna li zawjatan. Every time I come into the house, she would greet me at the door. These values are almost gone now. And if you speak about them, you're considered backwards and a misogynist and all these other labels that they slap on you. But this is the hadith of Rasulullah. Every time I come home, she comes to greet me. The husband is tired. He's been working. He's been dealing with all kinds of things outside. A smile from you will upend his entire life. It will change his mood. She greets me at the door. And every time I'm about to leave the house, she would walk me all the way to the door. Subhanallah. We do that with strangers. We do that with guests. We do that with clients. But when it comes to our own husband, suddenly it's misogynistic. She would walk me to the door. Every time she sees that I'm depressed, I'm upset for some reason, she would say to me, Ma ya hummuk, what is it that's causing you distress? Why are you upset? In kunta tahtammu lirizqik, if you're upset over your sustenance, over your livelihood, over financial matters, then you should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed your livelihood. You're not going to starve to death. Subhanallah. A wife telling her husband that you shouldn't worry about money? It's usually the other way around. It's usually a whole list of demands. I want this and I want that. And suddenly she's... This woman of all women is telling her husband that you shouldn't worry about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has... Taken responsibility for that. وَإِن كُنْتَ تَهْتَمُّ بِأَمْرِ آخِرَتِكَ And if you're upset over your afterlife, over what's going to happen to you when you die, فَزَادَكَ اللَّهُ هَمَّا May Allah increase your distress and your anguish. In other words, that's the good kind of distress to have. You should be more upset about that. The akhirah matters much more than the dunya. Subhanallah. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ The Prophet said to this man, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ عُمَّالًا وَهَذِهِ مِنْ عُمَّالِهَا لَهَا نِصْفُ أَجْرِ الشَّهِيدِ Allah has agents who work on his behalf on this earth and your wife is one of the agents of Allah and that she has the reward 
half the reward of a martyr in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A woman like this. Sometimes our respected sisters feel inadequate. They feel like they should do more. Somebody sent me a message just a couple of days ago saying that I see there's a man in the community and he does so much and he has a, a hay'a. In other words, he organizes majalis and he goes out there and he serves the zuwar and that sort of stuff. And I always feel jealous of him because I'm just sitting at home. I'm not doing anything. I said to her, who told you that your responsibility is the same as that man? There are plenty of things you can do. Sometimes some of our sisters feel inadequate. And I say to them, look at this hadith. Half the reward of a martyr who shivers in his blood as it gushes out when he's dying. Allah has given to this woman for just treating her husband with respect, honoring him, supporting him. This is what Khadija did to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. I'll conclude with this and I do apologize for taking so much of your time. The Holy Prophet once said, again, one of his wives became envious and she called Khadija Khudayja. And Khudayja is a derogatory term. It has a negative meaning. SubhanAllah, how much they used to hurt Rasulullah. Like the, the, the most delicate thing for Rasulullah was his beloved wife. And even though she's not even around anymore, they would try and hurt the Prophet. And I've seen how some commentators, Sunni commentators, once again, they bend over backwards to try and justify these hadiths. They say, oh, what this tells us is that it's okay for a woman to be jealous. How does it say it's okay? They're hurting Rasulullah. The Prophet would be insulted when his wife was insulted. In one hadith it says that this particular individual was screaming at Fatima to Zahra, to Sayyihuha. And she was calling her Ya bint Khadija. Instead of ascribing Fatima to Rasulullah, instead of saying Ya bint Rasulullah, she would call her Ya bint Khadija. Do you think that your mother had any virtue that we don't have? Do you think your mother was better than us? Wallah, she was not better than us. At this moment, Fatima to Zahra began crying. Imagine this is how you speak to an orphan. This is how you address someone who's lost his, her mother. Rasulullah walks in and he sees Fatima crying. So he says, Ya binta Muhammad, O daughter of Muhammad. What is it that makes you cry? She said, she didn't even say everything that that woman had told her. She said, she mentioned my mother. She spoke badly against my mother. That's why I'm crying. Rasulullah looked at that woman. He said to her, Be quiet. Khadija was the best thing that ever happened to me. Rizq is a sustenance from Allah, isn't it? It is something that God graces us with. Rasulullah said that Allah graced me with the sustenance of the love of Khadija. It was a rizq from Allah. Now imagine when this woman passed from this world, Rasulullah didn't declare a day of commemoration a day of sadness, or a week, or a month. He called the entire year, Amul Huzd, the year of sadness, having lost Khadija. They say that when she was about to die, and Khadija died of starvation. Maybe, maybe she was poisoned to death, who knows? The same as Abu Talib, maybe he was poisoned to death. I don't want to get into that, but at the very least, Khadija died under an extreme embargo. She starved to death on her deathbed. Rasulullah came to her. She said a few things. The first was, Ya Rasulullah, could you give me your cloak? I wish to be wrapped with your aba'a. When I'm lowered into my grave, I want to meet my creator being wrapped with the cloak of Rasulullah. 
Rasulullah said, of course, Ya Khadija, Ya Umm Zahra, you were so loyal to me. You gave me everything you had. You sacrificed so much. And they also say that before she died, she said to the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, look after my daughter Fatima. Try and protect her. Khadija was abandoned by everyone. She was the target of slander and attacks, even though prior to Islam, she was called at tahira the pure one, at a time when Hind, the mother of Muawiyah, was known to be a prostitute, Khadija was the pure one. She lived in a society like this with utmost purity. And yet, they attacked her, they abandoned her, they excommunicated her. And so she knows what is about to come in the way of her daughter Fatima. She said, Ya Rasulullah, look after our daughter. Rasulullah said, of course I will. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Ya Khadija, O oh mother of Islam, O oh mother of the Imams, O oh mother of Fatima, where were you? And where was Rasulullah when 40 armed men ambushed the house of Fatima? When Fatima was stuck behind the door between the wall and the door of the house? Where were you both when she was crushed and her infant boy was killed and she called out, Abatah, Ya Rasulallah, O oh Father, O oh God Messenger, Look at what they're doing to your sweetheart. Ah, ah, ah. One more thing, one more thing. You have to remember Karbala as well. When Khadija told Rasulullah to look after her daughter Fatima, yes, they were strangers. Yes, they were abandoned. But at the very least, she left Fatima to a loving father. Her father was still alive. And yet, lahfi alayk ya Aba Abdullah. Wa Husayna, wa Gariba. When Imam Al Hussein is leaving this world, who does he leave his orphans to? He leaves them all to Zainab. He says, O Khayya, look after the orphans after me. And he knows that Zainab will be the target of those whips, just like Sakina and Ruqayya will. <laughs>